context to this, Sam helped train up over 25 undergrad and graduate students from a range of institutions, including uh, not just Tulane, but also Cornell and William and Mary. Students were members from underrepresented groups in the sciences. And as a, as a testament to the quality of training that Sam provided there and mentoring, almost all of these students provided, uh, presented concert, presented posters at national or international level meetings, many of which received awards. And many of them have also gone on to uh, PhD programs and to be uh, first, author, first authors on papers that are either in review or in prep or forthcoming. And closer to home, Sam has really set herself apart um, by her commitment to leadership at many levels, both the lab, the department, the school, and the university, and also the broader community. I just want to touch on those for a minute. The lab, I know the students in the lab and also I are really going to miss Sam's mentorship and leadership, her generosity of spirit, and also the fact that she always brought excellent break, baked goods to all the lab <laughs> meetings. And she also introduced the Tim Tams lamb, which it'll live on without you, Sam. Um, at the level of the department, Sam has really acted as a role model, I think, for, for teaching um, more than anything. She's TA'd every semester that she's been here at Tulane, save one. The reason she didn't do it that one was because she received a competitive dissertation semester fellowship to help her write up. Departmental TA award. Um, and I know in the classes that she did with me, um, that she helped me with, she just did an outstanding job. And I think that most instructors feel the same way who've been lucky enough to work with her. At the level of the School of Science and Engineering in the university, Sam's done a great job in terms of civic engagement and leadership, including um, winning the School of Science and Engineering Woodrow Wilson Teaching Fellowship Award. She's been the Vice President of Graduate Student Studies Association. She's been the Graduate Senator on the Tulane University Graduate and Professional Students Studies Association. And oh yeah, she's also served on the Honor Board and the Curriculum Committee. And <laughs> We got to go. I'm going to cut myself short here because Sam uh, needs to talk as well. I just wanted to talk for one more moment about her role in the broader community, and I wanted to highlight that she's played in, in GIST, um, which is a program that brings middle school girls, often from underrepresented groups in the sciences, um, into, into Tulane for a full day of engagement with and sort of hands on engagement in what it means to do science, encouraging them to follow that trajectory. It's been a very successful program. And Sam's contributed to that in a big way. So I'm running out of space on the page, running out of time. Um, but I did just want to close by saying the obvious. Sam, you've excelled in research, in teaching, in mentoring, in civic engagement, and broader engagement with the community. And I think that all of these are really key traits for a scientist in today's world. I feel like you've done a great job getting a foundation on that here at Tulane. It's been a pleasure working with you, and I'm really excited to see where your trajectory takes you. So without further ado, Sam. All right, thank you guys. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, well, it seems only fitting. I did my prospectus defense on Halloween, so it seems fitting that my actual defense would be on St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. And thank you for everyone that's here. As Jordan said, I want to be talking about my research on non-breeding season ornamentation and red back fairy events. To begin with, biological ornaments are char characteristics of animals that are often associated with more of a decorative than a utilitarian function. And so you can see that ornaments are seen in a variety of taxa. They're often very colorful or elaborate, and they can be used in things like male-male competition or in mate choice and sexual selection. Darwin's theory of sexual selection was in part developed to explain why you might see these really exaggerated traits, um, like exaggerated plumage ornamentation in birds. And the idea is if you look at these traits, they seem like they would be perhaps deleterious to the animals that have them um, because they're really ridiculous and they seem like they're, they're not really useful. Um, but they're actually really useful in terms of attracting potential mates and that males that have the biggest or the best or the brightest trait might be more successful. So many of you have probably seen the video of this bird of paradise doing its ridiculous courtship dance, which is associated with elaborate, elaborate plumage. And if you haven't seen it, um, I'm not going to show it for, for, to you, um, so I'd encourage you to go back and Google it. Now, I would also be willing to bet that most of you don't know much about what these birds do during the non-breeding season. 
And so just like there's this bias within this room, there's also a bias in research. And you can see here, this is the proportion of ecological studies that's conducted at different times of the year. And you can see that there's a lot of studies during the breeding season and less studies during the non-breeding season. And these different shades of blue show different taxa of animals. And you can see across taxa, there's a lot less known about the non-breeding season. So the non-breeding season are, is characterized more by foraging and survival, whereas the breeding season is characterized by reproduction and rearing offspring. Um, that's not to say that foraging isn't always important, um, but it's more so that what we think about happening in the non-breeding season. We think about the non-breeding season as a time when animals, their main goal is just to survive and make it to the next breeding season so they can reproduce again. It's important to study the non-breeding season because the majority of individuals' lives are actually spent not breeding. Um, it's also really important because breeding and non-breeding periods are inevitably linked. And so if you think about this, seasonal interactions can happen at both the individual and the population level. So at the individual level, if you have an animal that's in a really good habitat and it eats a lot of food during the non-breeding season, it might enter the breeding season in better condition and have more offspring. At the population level, you might have food declines or food, something hard that happens to the whole population that could cause a population decline. And that would reduce population density, which might make it harder to find a potential mate or it might make it easier to find a territory. Much as it's interesting to study ornaments during the breeding season and to understand the costs and consequences of ornamentation, it's also understanding to ask these same types of questions during the non-breeding season. So the first general question that we can ask about ornamentation that's interesting is what are the costs of producing ornaments? And we can think about this in terms of more proximate costs, like what is the mechanism for producing an ornament? Or we can think about the social costs of, display, of maintaining ornamentation. Um, we can think about ways that males might minimize costs. Um, so if you think about displaying an ornament for a really long period or most of your life, as opposed to this short period when you're breeding, um, you can think that the cheaper that you can do that, that would be better for a male. Um, conversely, we can also think about benefits of ornamentation. So in general, if you have multiple potential phenotypes, um, ornamented or unornamented, there's probably benefits to either of those phenotypes. The study system that I used to address these questions was red-backed fairy wrens in Australia. Um, red-backed fairy wrens have two subspecies. Across the northern part of Australia, the top end, uh, the males have a more crimson back. And then across eastern Australia, the males have a more orange back. And my first two chapters take place um, near Darwin, in the Northern Territory, and then my third chapter takes place near Brisbane in the orange subspecies. In both subspecies, the females are brown, um, like this, and then both subspecies also have an unornamented male phenotype that also looks like this. Um, so if I didn't know the sex of this individual because of um, DNA fingerprinting, we wouldn't know that it was a male. Um, they look pretty much the same. So I told you that I'm going to talk about ornamentation today. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about ornamentation in the system because it's really important to understand. And it also sets up why the system is, a re is really good for asking questions about ornamentation. Uh, there's going to be two bars along here that, that show the annual cycle and the potential plumage strategies of two males. Now, during the breeding season, most of the males are ornamented red and black. And that's going to be denoted by a black bar um, seen here. And you can see there's two potential males. They're both red and black during the breeding season here. Um, and I'm going to refer to that throughout the talk as either ornamented or red-black plumage. Fairy wrens molt twice per year. And so most, all the males molt after breeding um, in the post-breeding molt. And you can see that it happens in relative synchrony throughout the population. And in that molt, most of the males acquire brown plumage or unornamented plumage. And so you can see here, again, both of these potential males molt at the same time and they molt into brown plumage. Now, intuitively, if I told you that males molt, or birds molt twice a year in the species, you might think that the other molt would take place six months later. But actually, the pre-breeding molt is highly asynchronous in the population. And so you can see that some males molt really early um, and then would, would acquire ornament, ornamented plumage again and be red and black for actually most of the year, whereas some males delay that molt and wait until right before the breeding season. And so you can see there's this uh, variation within the population and how long males express ornamentation. Simplifying this even further, what it really means is that when I'm there during the non-breeding season, um, males can be either red and black or they can be brown. Um, this is a little simplistic. There's one caveat that I want to throw out there, and that's that fairy wrens have what's known as delayed plumage maturation. So young males in their first or second potential breeding season 
can delay um, obtaining red and black plumage, and they can also breed in brown plumage. So there's a lot of evidence in fairy wrens that being ornamented is a good thing, that there's, be there's benefits to ornamentation. And so during the breeding season, we know that, that ornamented males have higher reproductive success, so they have more offspring than brown males. We also have evidence in other fairy wren species that being ornamented during the non-breeding season is beneficial. So in other species of fairy wrens, the longer you display ornamentation, um, the more likely you, you are to have more offspring. So in my thesis, I'm gonna talk about three chapters that kind of dip, get at different aspects of ornamentation. Um, the first two chapters look more at the signal itself, and then the third chapter looks overall at more the behavior of the birds. I'm gonna look at the hormonal mechanism. be ornamented. So what the potential adaptive benefits of ornamentation are. So getting into my first chapter, um, hormonal mechanisms for plumage ornamentation. So sexual ornaments are often considered to be honest signals of male quality. And that's important because both males and females might use an ornament to make some sort of judgment about a male. Um, it's important if they're if they're basing um, something on, a, on an ornament that it's honest and that there's something that's enforcing that cost. Because if there are no cost to ornamentation, all males would have the biggest and the best and the brightest signal and it wouldn't really tell you anything about that male. So there's a lot of things that can maintain signal honesty and one potential um, hormone is the androgen testosterone and that's they regulate signal honesty by linking sexually selected traits to male condition or to immune system quality and the thought is that androgens can be costly to produce or to, to have in your blood and so having androgens for a, lo a long time might be costly to a male. Androgens have been linked to a number of sexual signals across taxa. Um, they're linked to courtship displays, both vocal and visual. They're linked to ornaments like the facial shield and the smorehead. And then they're linked to plumage in some birds. So fairy wrens are an example of a bird that there's previous evidence that androgens and ornamentation are linked. Um, androgens are linked to not only plumage, but also other morphological aspects like bill color and the cloacal protuberance, which is male, where males store sperm, like territoriality. So there's experimental and correlational evidence that for young fairy wrens, uh, ornamentation is linked to androgens. And so these pictures here all show first year birds. In panel A, this male was given a, a testosterone implant in the month prior to breeding, so right before it bred, and it quickly molted into ornamented plumage. This male in the top right panel was given a control implant, and he maintained brown plumage and stayed in brown plumage throughout the, the breeding season. And then the bottom two panels show that females, when they're given testosterone implants, can have some but not all aspects of male ornamentation. So really strong evidence here that when given testosterone implants, there's this linkage between plumage and ornamenta or ornamentation and androgens. So our research here, question here, was do androgens regulate plumage ornamentation for early molting males? And remember that these early molting males are molting months earlier prior to the breeding season. So we were there from June to August, and the birds don't start breeding until like December. So that's like four to six months before breeding. And so our first prediction was that, yes, we would, in line with previous research, we would find a relationship um, that ornamented and molting males, or males molting in ornamentation, would have high androgen levels. But we also thought that there would, it would be beneficial if males were able to obtain ornamentation without having high androgen levels. And again, that's associated with the cost of androgens. So if there's some other mechanism there, or if there's a way that males can avoid that, that would be beneficial. To do this, we took blood samples from all of the birds that we captured during the non-breeding season, and then we took those blood, brought those blood samples back here to the states, and we measured the, the plasma androgen levels in the blood. We also scored <coughs> ornamentation and molt of all the birds that we captured and observed. And importantly, it's really easy to tell when males are changing from brown to black plumage. Um, you can see that even when males have just started molting, you can see these black feathers appearing and they really stand out against the brown plumage. Um, these are all pictures of the same male that we captured throughout the non-breeding season. And so you can see that change from brown to black plumage. And we scored our ornamentation on a scale of zero um, being brown to 100 being red and black. We also induced mold in a subset of males because we wanted 
to see if outside of the molt cycle, what color would the feathers grow in if we plucked them. So we plucked two tail feathers and we wanted to see if they would grow in brown or black. Um, we then did model selection at two levels. And so at the first most basic level, we compared androgen detection probability among all the birds based on things like sex and, and ornamentation and mold status. Um, and the assays that we use to measure blood androgens don't always pick them up. So we just wanted to say yes or no, are there androgens in the blood that we can detect? Now at the second level, for the birds that we did detect androgens, we measured that, compared the actual level of androgens in the blood, again, on the, using those same potential models. Um, there are some other variables that we included, like year and day and time of day, that weren't important, um, but they were um, at least considered in the models. Um, one thing that was not in the models was male age. And that's because we started this population in 2012. Um, so we, there was a lack of known age structure in the population. We didn't know how old all the males were, um, but we do know that most of the birds were adults. Um, because there was, wasn't very much breeding while I was there. Um, so most of the birds we first captured in 2012, we knew they were adults, but we didn't know their exact age. So we did not include that in the models. So answering the question of do androgens regulate plumage ornamentation, first off, um, the probability of detecting androgens was similar across phenotypes. So for ornamented males, females, unornamented males, whether they were molting or not, no matter what, it was always about 50%. You can see when looking at the actual androgen levels that they're also pretty similar across phenotypes. So this shows that females, ornamented males, and unornamented males all have relatively similar levels, at least on average. Um, these levels are all similar to those found in pre-breeding season brown males or unornamented males. Now there's a couple things you'll probably notice. One is there's this, this male here um, that's an outlier. Um, importantly, if we remove him, it doesn't change our results. And then we also think that this male is really interesting because it, there was probably something going on in terms of social interactions with this male right before we captured it that caused him to have an increase in androgen levels. And this shows that this temporary spike in androgen levels doesn't cause that male to molt to ornamented plumage right away. When we look at the results from the feather plucking, um, we again found that there was not a strong link between uh, androgens and feather color. And so you can see we had males that were, we detected androgens and males that we didn't detect androgens. And in both of those groups, some of them grew in black feathers and some of them grew brown feathers. So no tight link there. It also seems like maybe the relationship between androgens and feather color, or just feather color in general, is a little bit more complicated than we previously thought. Um, so this is, shows examples of males that started to grow in feathers black and switched to brown, males that started to grow in their feathers brown and switched to black, and then males that were growing in feathers that were both brown and black at the same time. So why do we think we found different results in these previous studies? Well, first off, we think that there might be age-dependent differences in, the, in how birds respond to androgens. And so in other species of birds like mannequins, shown here, there's these really structured um, differences between birds of different ages and what their plumages look like. So you can see that here, first year males are green, second year males have some aspects of ornamentation, and then third year males and after that will be in what's known as definitive plumage. And we think that something similar is going on with the fairy wrens, although it might be a little bit more plastic because of that plasticity and delayed plumage maturation. Is that once males obtain ornamented plumage for the first time during the breeding season, after that, they're always gonna be ornamented when they breed. And so it might not really depend as much on these elevated androgen levels. And we do have some evidence that that might be true. Um, there's people in this room that have been studying fairy wrens and captured hundreds, if not thousands of fairy wrens over the years. And every, every male that we know of, once he's obtained ornamentation, they never revert back to breeding in brown plumage. There are a couple other um, things that might be going on that I wanna briefly mention, but that we don't really think are happening. One is that there could just be temporal differences in the mechanism. So again, we do think that the time of year has to do with why we found differences in androgen levels because it was non-breeding versus breeding. Um, but we don't think that the mechanism would change based on the time of year. Um, there's some evidence that maybe the hormones that regulate vocal displays in some birds might change based on the time of year, but we're not aware of any studies where the mechanisms for ornamentation would change like this. It's also possible that there would be geographic or genetic differences between these two subspecies of fairy wrens. Um, but based on what we know about the system, and across since we don't think that's likely. So what this means is that being ornamented during the non-breeding season might not be that physiologically 
typically costly to males, at least in terms of having elevated androgen levels throughout this time, which is a really good news for those males because it means they don't have that additional burden of androgen levels. Um, it, we do think, or we do know that there could be other costs associated with androgens, and I'll talk about that more in some of my other chapters. The future directions for this work include looking at the density of androgen receptors in the blood. So it might be the receptors themselves that are different or that are important, not the actual um, plasma androgen levels. And then maybe looking at gene expression to see what's going on there. So for my second chapter, I'm going to move on to focus on that those red vacuum feathers because we think that's the more, most important signal in these birds. So those red back feathers are produced by pigments called carotenoids. And carotenoids are commonly used as examples of honest signals across taxa. Um, they're thought to indicate foraging quality, and that's because animals can't um, make carotenoids themselves. They get them from plants, or they get them from their diet. So it's thought to indicate foraging quality. So animals like these guppies would get carotenoids directly from the plants that they eat, but animals like fairy wrens get them from insects, which get them from the plants. Now, house finches are a really good example of a well-studied species with a carotenoid-based trait. So we know in house finches from, from tons of studies, um, there's books written about this, but in carotenoids, if you give, or in house finches, if you give them more carotenoids or supplement their food with carotenoids, they grow in redder feathers. So that shows that it's linked to diet. We know that females prefer males that are more red. So it shows it's important in mate choice. And then we also know that males that are more red are better parents. So there's evidence at, at all these different levels that a carotenoid based signal is honest. Now, I said I was going to be talking about a potential trade-off. So that trade-off is between the timing of signal expression, um, in this case, molt, but it could be whatever, the, whatever causes the signal to, to occur, and then the signal quality itself. So in some species, um, expressing a trait for a longer period of time is thought to indicate that, that that individual is better. And in that case, the duration of signal expression or the timing of signal expression is the sexually selected trait more so than the signal itself. And that's true in birds like these whitas where there's more opportunity for sexual selection to act on that timing. Now we also know in a lot of species that the quality of the signal is important, or that being more red is better. And so importantly, this is a good system study of this because both of these things are true for fairy wrens as well. So we know in fairy wrens that early signal expression is better, that males that express ornamentation for a longer period or longer part of the year are gonna have more chicks. And then we also know that being redder is better. And so there was, these authors conducted an experiment during, um, in the orange subspecies, and they actually captured males and painted them red, and they found that the males that were painted red had way more offspring, so these are the males that were painted red, and they did a lot better than the orange males. So again, there's this, this potential for trade-off between when males produce a signal and then the quality of the signal they produce. So the reason we think there might really be opportunity for there to be a trade-off here is this is what Australia looks like um, during the non-breeding season. So you can see that the grass is relatively brown and dry. Um, sometimes it's not there at all um, if there's been a fire. Um, and that's really important because fairy wrens live in the grass and they eat insects that are in the grass. And the grass is lush and green. Um, you can see it's a lot taller, there's a lot more of it. And if you think about um, the insects, there's gonna be a lot more insects as well um, because the, the greening up of the grass is associated with rainfall. Now, if you think about producing a trait that's showing off your foraging ability or the amount of insects you get, and you think about producing it while you're in this environment versus this environment, um, it seems like there could be some sort of trade-off there. So again, the research question that we asked here was, is there a trade-off between signal timing versus the quality of the signal that was produced? So we had three alternative predictions. The first prediction was just that early molting males would be more red. And that the idea where, there was just that males that molt early are better. So they're going to be better in every aspect of, of, of that they can produce. The second prediction was maybe late molting males would be better. And thinking, going back to that previous slide, we thought that if males delayed molting until it started raining and the grass got really green and there was lots of food, it might be easier for those males to produce a good quality signal. Um, the third prediction was that maybe early molting males can actually change their signals across time. So if you think about it, if they're producing a signal for nine months instead of three, um, maybe the feathers are fading over time, or maybe something's happening to the, to the feathers that's making them more red. And although plumage is generally thought of as a static trait, um, there, and there is some evidence now that birds can um, modify plumage signals outside of molt. So molt is really evolutionary constrained in birds. Um, most bird species molt once or twice a year, 
Um, they can't just molt again if they feel like it. They don't just replace all of their feathers um, again. But there's evidence in some species that birds modify plumage. Um, examples that I have shown here, um, birds like flamingos have carotenoids in their preen gland, which is what they use to kind of fix their feathers. It's like brushing your hair. Um, and they have carotenoids in that oil in the preen gland. And when they brush it on their feathers or wipe it on their feathers, it makes them look more red. Um, birds like starlings, um, when they molt, their feathers have really uh, real speckled appearance. And then the tips of the feathers, there's abrasion over time so that they wear away. And then eventually during the breeding season, the males are really shiny and iridescent. Um, a little closer to home, some of you guys might have noticed that the cardinals are getting ready to breed here and they look especially bright red. Um, when cardinals molt, they actually have gray tips to their feathers and that gray wears away over time. So to, at this time of year, the males look a lot more red. So for this chapter, we captured adults during both the non-breeding and breeding seasons. We scored both plumage and molt at the birds. So plumage on that scale from zero to 100, um, with zero being brown and 100 being red black, and then molt to see if birds were replacing feathers. We categorized the males in two, same, in two categories. They were call, called early molters, if when I was there during the summer, or our summer at least, from June to August, they were ornamented or molting in ornamented plumage. If I left Australia and the birds were still brown, and then I went back um, at Christmas break and they were red and black, I called them a late molter. Males. We collected a small sample of red feathers from their upper back. Now these pictures so, show natural variation in the population. So these are both birds from the red subspecies. Um, you can see that this male is a lot more red than this male. And it's not enough for me to simply have looked at all of the birds and rated them on a scale of, of redness. Um, we actually had to get a number to quantify that. And so to do that, we measured the hue of the back feathers using a spectrophotometer. Um, we, met, we got reflecting curves of the feathers, and then we modeled that in the avian visual color space, which really just means we measured the color in the way that birds would actually be seeing them, which is important. And that gave us a number. Um, and that was capturing the variation in the population from orange to red. So if you think here about what the males could look like during these two sampling points, the non-breeding season, um, birds that molted here were, called, were early molters, and then birds that molted sometime in here um, were late molters. And first off, we're going to kind of ignore these brown birds. Um, brown doesn't fall anywhere on the spectrum from orange to red, so we didn't take feather samples from those birds. So there's three potential categories of feathers that we could compare. So first, we wanted to know if timing of signal production affected quality of the signal. And so to do that, we compared feathers taken from non-breeding season early molting birds to feathers taken collected during the breeding season of late molting birds. Next, we wanted to know if anything changed within an individual. So here we looked at feather samples taken from the same individual captured at two different time points. And then we wanted to see what the birds looked like during the breeding season, who was more red during the breeding season, because um, that's probably when it's really the most important. And so for these next few graphs, um, they're going to be color-coded to show which of these categories of males. So here, this is an early molting male in the non-breeding season, and this is its feather hue here. Um, a higher hue here would be more red. And you can see that back hue did not vary based on molt timing. So in these two categories of males, there's no difference in the plumage of their back. However, we found that within individuals, the males tended to increase over time. What's really interesting is that the males that initially molted in more orange um, somehow changed and got more red, and all these males concentrated on a really red, high-quality signal during the breeding season. And what this meant was that during the breeding season, these early molting males, so there's a change from this period to this period, and these males were the most red. So they're more red than they were earlier, and they're more red than the males that molted later. So obviously we found this difference. We wanted to know what was happening. And first off, we ruled out abrasion. Um, there's no noticeable difference in the, the tips of the feathers. And they're also very small feathers. So based on the way that we were measuring redness using the spectrophotometer, we don't think we would have captured anything that was caused by abrasion. Um, there is a chance that the birds have carotenoids in their preen oil. And that would be an, a, a good next step would be to measure that. Um, so I'm going to leave that as a question mark because we don't know if that's happening. Um, but what we do think is happening is is a phenomenon called adventitious molt. Now, so I told you that the birds molt twice a year. Um, any molt that happens outside of those annual molts is considered adventitious molt because it's kind of an accidental, accidental replacement of feathers. So if a bird loses a feather, it would replace it, and that's known as adventitious molt. In these birds that changed back hue, 
we actually found that most of them, when I captured them during the breeding season, had some level of back molt. Um, this was not part of the pre-breeding molt because, again, they did that back in like July, and then this is six months later, and they were still showing signs of molt. And so we think that's a way that males might be um, replacing the feathers gradually of these ornaments that they have for a really long period, and then actually making them more red records. We actually found that adventitious molt is pretty common across both males and females in the population. So this is the first study to our knowledge to provide evidence that adventitious molt might enable males to modify their signals, which you think is really exciting. Um, we also think that it might be common or a lot more common than we think in other systems. And it hasn't really been shown before because it's difficult to measure. So it requires having individually marked birds, capturing those birds across multiple time points, and then measuring signal quality across multiple time points, which isn't really something that a lot of studies do. Um, however, uh, we think it could be especially common in places like the tropics, because studies that have molt measured at least molt in the tropics have found that some level of continuous molt or adventitious molt is really common in those species. Um, we also think it might be common in harsh environments. So if you think about um, what I showed you, what it looks like in the territory, that's a pretty harsh environment for a bird that's only this big. Um, so you can think that it's going to be losing feathers occasionally, and that when it replaces those feathers, if the ecological conditions are better, it makes sense that they might be able to replace them with a better signal. It might be happening across a lot of species that have um, variation in trait expression. This also means that males don't necessarily face a trade-off between signal timing and signal quality. And in a way, it seems like males might be able to have their cake and eat it too, and that they molt early, which is, means that they're better, and then they're more red, which also means they're better. Um, so overall, that's a really good thing for those males. And then a next step, the important next step in this system would be actually if, seeing if we can link adventitious molt um, to fitness consequences, either in this species or in other systems. For my last chapter, I'm going to move on to talk about the behavior of the birds and see how they might benefit from being ornamented. All right, so hopefully the first thing that you notice when you look at this picture is that this red and black bird is a lot more conspicuous against this brown backdrop than a brown bird is. And so the question here really is why would you want to be ornamented when there's, when there's these obvious costs to having plumage ornamentation? And I said earlier that generally when we think about having discrete potential phenotypes or variation in a signal, there's probably costs and benefits associated with those different extremes. Now here, in terms of costs, um, there's ob there obviously might be predation costs associated with being more conspicuous. Um, fairy wrens are really small, and they would probably be a nice snack for almost anything in Australia. Um, there's also potentially social costs of um, expressing those ornaments. And then there's po potentially production costs associated with producing ornaments. The best studied example of why males might benefit from having ornaments during the non-breeding season is what's thought of as as an ornament being a status signal or being what's known as a badge of status. And so if you have a better a badge of status, that might mean that you're a high quality male and it can eliminate, it can make you socially dominant basically. So it eliminate, eliminates aggressive interactions and gives you an increased access to resources. So this is common in birds like house sparrows. And here you can see that the black bib on the bird's throat is different in size between these males. And the idea here is that the, these males could look at each other and kind of size each other up and a male could say, oh, that male's bib is bigger than mine. He's probably better. I'm not going to fight him for that food. And so males that are socially dominant with these big bibs might have increased access to resources. So within this system, we thought that that was a potential benefit of being ornamented, that maybe ornamented males might have more access to food resources. And so our predictions here were that ornamented males might be found in higher quality habitat, and they might be in better body condition than the unornamented males. Now I'm going to take a step back for a minute and talk about the social environment that these birds are in, because it's actually really different uh, between the two seasons. During the breeding season, the birds are in uh, breeding pairs or in small groups. They can have helpers from the previous year that, that aren't able to get a territory of their own. Um, these birds are socially monogamous, which means they have male-female pairs that maintain a territory and take care of chicks, but they're sexually promiscuous, which means that both the males and females will mate outside of that pair bond. Um, so it's really important that the males are territorial because they don't want other males coming in. They would then have to feed themselves. Now, after the breeding season, the territory boundaries dissolve and we get these flocks of birds. So you can see the flocks vary in size 
ties in composition. Um, they're generally are loosely composed of family groups, but these family groups can come together. And we have flocks that can be up to 30 or more birds all hanging out together. So we thought there could be something going on with those social interactions. And it seems like they might be important during this period. Now, importantly, we found during the non-breeding season, birds still perform uh, displays when they're in red and black plumage. So I'm going to show you a video that shows you what a display looks like. And so you're going to see a brown bird is going to fly in, and then this, this ornamented male is going to do the display for this bird. And it happens really fast. It's almost impossible to see what he did. Um, but he almost did a backflip to try to show off that red plumage that bird that flew in. So it's going to have play again in slow motion. Um, and you can see he really flips himself over backward. And again, we think that red hue or that back signal is really important in this system. All right, so remember I said that the flocks can be 20 to 30 birds. Um, you can you can watch birds um, interacting in this flock, and there can be five or six bright males or ornamented males all performing these displays. So we thought maybe there's something interesting going on in the social interactions. So a second non-mutually exclusive hypothesis was that ornamented males might be investing in social interactions during the non-breeding season and performing these co courtship displays, and there could be a benefit associated with that. Now, so our predictions that would support that hypothesis are that males would have um, more social interactions. They would have larger home ranges because they'd be traveling over more area to interact with more birds. And then obviously that they would perform courtship displays because that's an important part of this. So to measure these things, we conducted behavioral observations of, the, of color banded birds. And so we went out and we watched flocks of birds and we recorded the flock composition, so who was in the flock. And then we took a GPS point of where the flock was. And we did that at five minute intervals. We also captured males and collected morphological data so that we could measure male condition. So we created, um, using the behavioral observations, we created social networks that could actually map the social interactions and see what was going on there. In the social networks, each individual is um, identified by a node, um, which I'll show you an example of what this looks like in a minute. And then interactions mean that a bird was in the same flock, and those are represented by lines connecting individuals. Um, the interactions were not considered to be direct, directed, so we didn't have any who was initiated, initiating interactions or receiving interactions. If birds were seen in the same flock, they were considered to be interacting. We, now we calculated um, multiple, met, multiple social metrics from those networks. One of those is node degree, which is the number of individuals that a bird interacting with. Um, it doesn't take into account how frequently they interacted. Um, and then the second one is node strength, which does take into account the proportion of times that birds were seen together. Um, for the purpose, purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on degree. So I'm, from now on, when I talk about social metrics or social interactions, I'm only talking about no degree. Now, we also, for a subset of males, um, created home ranges so we could look at space use of the individuals. And we did that for all the birds that were seen at least 30 times. And that's because we needed to see the birds that many times in order to get an accurate um, estimation of how much space it was covering. Within those home ranges, that's where we measured habitat quality. So we looked at the greenness of the habitat within those home ranges using remote census data, and we use what's called normalized differential vegetation index. Basically, it's a measure of greenness, and it's used often as a proxy for food availability, with the idea that in more green habitat, there should be more food. Um, importantly, within the, our study site, um, we showed a correlation between bird density and habitat greenness. So there's more birds using greener areas, which indicates that better habitat. So to look at if ornamented males had higher access to resources, again, we compared habitat quality or greenness within the home ranges, and we also compared male condition based on ornamentation. To see if males were investing in social interactions, we compared no degree of social interactions to phenotype, so whether the birds were ornamented or not. And so that was kind of a most basic level, and it used all of the interactions. And then using the subset of males that were seen at least 30 times, we also compared the social interactions to home range size, and then to a potential interaction between home range size and plumage ornamentation. Now, importantly, um, social metrics like degree aren't, bio, aren't independent, so we can't do traditional statistical tests. And I'm not going to really get into the test that we did here, but I'm going to tell you we did a lot of permutations that worked on the data stream, and it went back. And it went, basically, we went back to the flocks that we saw, and we swapped birds around, and we calculated a thousand different networks and compared the network that we had to those permutations. 
So first off, when looking at access to resources, we found that there was no difference in male condition or greenness of the habitat based on male ornamentation. Um, this here is a picture of, of the social network. And there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to walk you through it a little bit. Um, the, the nodes, so each of these nodes is an individual. They're spatially located where the center of the bird's home ranges were. So this is where we actually saw them on the field site. And then they're color-coded um, by phenotype. And what I really want you to take away from this figure is that the social network is really well connected. Um, so you can see there's lots of lines connecting these individuals. I'm not expecting that you can see what's actually really going on here with the network. Um, so I've broken that down for you. And you can see here that ornamented males, um, which are here, um, this is their connections to these different classes of birds. So ornamented males had more connections to all of the different potential classes of birds that they could be interacting with. And you can see it's especially pronounced um, with their interactions to females, that they're interacting with more females. We also found that ornamented males had larger home ranges. And so these are examples. Um, this is an example home range of an ornamented male, and then this is an example home range of an unornamented male. You can see there's a really big difference there. Um, the average home range size was about five hectares, which is a really big space for this little tiny bird to be flying around. Um, and it's much, it's much more of an area than birds would be using during the breeding season. And you can see that when we looked at it, uh, at it across um, birds, that the average home range size of ornamented males was bigger than for or unornamented males. Now, what was really cool here was that when we compared home range size to the social interactions, we found an interaction between plumage ornamentation and home range size. And so for ornamented males, the bigger a home range was for an ornamented male, the more social interactions he had. So the larger area he covered, he was interacting with more birds. And we did not find that for unornamented males. And so we think that the ornamented males were traveling around over, bigger, over more areas, and in doing so, interacting with more birds. So I'm going to show you another video. In this video, I want you to pay attention to all these little brown birds that are down here. And what's really important is that they're really excited about this display that Snow is doing. They're really watching him. Um, it's going to play again in slow motion. Um, birds actually falls off its perch. It's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so here he comes. All right, so if that video right there was one of our behavioral observation points, um, within that video, there's six birds. You guys might not have seen this other male that's hiding up here in the tree. Um, there were six birds, and they would all be considered to be interacting. The degree within that interaction would be the same for all the birds. Um, and so what we think is happening is that, at least within that interaction, the degree is the same. Um, and so these, these brown birds would have the same degree as these red and black birds. But the ornamented males are doing that over a large area and they're going around and actively displaying to these all these different groups and in doing so that really adds up and so they have more social interactions overall. So in summary, we did not find support for the hypothesis that males might have enhanced access to resources as a result of ornamentation. Um, we're not really ruling that out. Um, it's possible that there were some subtle behavioral differences between these males, like maybe they had to spend less time foraging, um, or maybe there was differences in microhabitat use. Um, there's also a potential that these males did have more resources, and then they used that excess energy to do these courtship displays. However, our results do suggest that males are investing in social interactions. And we think that this shows that birds might actually be using space, um, in part driven by their social behavior rather than just foraging locations for sexual selection. So the next step in this system um, would be to actually try to connect these non-breeding season social networks with reproductive success and say, are females choosing these males that were displaying to them months earlier, and are they remembering who these males are when they're making their mate choice decisions? Which would be really interesting in terms of thinking about when mate choice happens. So going back to this diagram that shows all three chapters, in my first chapter, I showed you that ornamentation is not tightly linked to androgens, in, in, at least during the non-breeding season for this bird. In my second chapter, I showed you that there's not a trade-off between signal timing and signal quality for the males that are able to molt early. So they're able to acquire a signal earlier, um, and they're able to also be more red during the breeding season. And then in my third chapter, I showed you that a potential benefit to this might be that these birds are displaying to females, which might have carryover effects 
contest that could affect breeding season success. So overall, these studies, or these chapters have shown that it's really important to study ornamentation year round. It's especially important to study things like the mechanisms for signal production at the time period when the signals are actually produced. And that can be especially good because it's not confounded by other factors that might be associated with breeding. So if you think about it, birds during the breeding season might be territorial, which is associated with androgen levels. And during the non-breeding season, we don't necessarily have those confounding factors. We also showed that males are able to achieve ornamentation and these really nice red signals with maybe relatively low physiological costs, which shows a way that males might be able to minimize costs of being ornamented, ornamented for longer periods. Um, our results also suggest that these social interactions and courtship displays during the non-breeding season might be really important in this, season, in this system and probably other systems as well. And so at the start, when I told you that the non-breeding season is just associated with foraging and survival, hopefully with, with these chapters, I've showed you that there's a lot more going on during the non-breeding season. So with that, I would like to thank my committee, um, Jordan, Liz, Tom, and Mike. Thank, thanks to all of you guys for, for being here, not only today, but throughout the last six years. Um, I want to thank the IRIS grant for funding, and then also the department um, for having the last semester off from teaching in order to, to work on these chapters. Um, um, all of the fair run people, um, not just the people I have listed here, but the previous PhD students, and then the new students in our lab that are continuing this research. Shout out to Nicole, who helped out a lot with the third chapter and did some cool telemetry stuff, um, coming twice with IRES and then again as a master's student. Um, I'd like to thank my own lab for help with writing and then the Dairy Berry Writing Workshop, which has been really helpful. As far as the field site goes, I want to thank Richard Fluxen, not only for offering me his property to do research at for three years, but really welcoming me, welcoming me into his home, uh, which has been really great. And then all of my friends and family um, for all of your help throughout the last years. Um, it's been really great. And then, obviously, Piper um, has <laughs> been a great help for the last two years. Uh, so these are pictures of all the IRIS crews over the years. Um, we've really had a great team of people. And we had, as Jordan said, we've had over 20 or 25 students come to Australia. Um, it's really exciting to see the work that these students have done and the work that they're continuing to do. And then with that, I'm going to leave you with a picture um, that was awarded the cutest fairy run in 2014. <laughs>